Uh, just a couple of things before we actually begin um, the um, teaching tonight, and that is thank you everyone for being present at the Rite of Welcome. Uh, we now, you are now our official catechumens and also candidates for full reception in the church. Um, as I started praying the Rite of Welcome, I actually realized how long it was going to take for us to do each of you individually and have the psalm response sung on top of all the other times that the psalm response was sung, so I kind of abbreviated it a little bit. So um, I apologize if I didn't call you each by name, but I felt like we weren't going to get down and get mass going. And with the parking situation here at St. Gertrude's, we really have to be strict with our um, 60 minutes. But I think it went very well, um, and all of you practice well, so I think we were, we were prepared, well prepared for uh, the celebration of the right of welcome. A um, couple things, one was um, normally, as you know, when you come into church, we always genuflect, and when we leave church, we genuflect as well to acknowledge the Blessed Sacrament, but uh, I think because when you will be excused after the announcements at the 9.30 Mass, because you're all there in a group, I, I think it's just impossible to try to genuflect off because I think you'll be kicking each other and kind of like falling over each other. So I talked to Sheila today. We just thought it would be important after the priest dismisses you if you could all just make a profound bow together, okay? And then just leave. That would be <coughs> an easier thing to do. There was a second thing. Um, communion. Communion. Okay. Um, there is um, some people who believe that if you are Catholic, you can go to communion and cross yourself like this, and the priest will give you a blessing. If you feel so called to do that, uh, that's fine. It's not of my persuasion. Um, I know other priests think it's fine. The reason why I don't care for that is because the communion has a specific purpose and that is to go to communion and I do think that if uh, it's, it doesn't have any other purpose um, to receive a blessing to substitute Holy Communion doesn't seem theologically correct um, so um, you will receive a blessing at the end of Mass as everyone receives a blessing at the end of Mass these are one of these situations where um, I can give you my opinion on it and um, you can decide on your own. I just don't think that going, getting in a communion line to receive a blessing is the proper place to receive a blessing. But if you want to, you're more than welcome to do so. If you want to receive a blessing, you just simply cross yourself like this and that is the indication to the priest that you uh, wish to receive a blessing. Any questions on that? Good. Okay, um, I would ask you to open your um, <coughs> catechism, your, the American catechism. And dress appropriately. And dress appropriately, of course. Um, dress appropriately means for gentlemen, dress trousers and dresser, and appropriately for um, uh, the women as well. Okay, um, okay um, we are going to, I think this is page 287, or it's not 387, 387, the Fifth Amendment, the promotion of the culture of life. Uh, the first page and a half, of course, is a beautiful description of uh, Dorothy Day um, and um, her own coming to the church and um, the life that she lived before, very much influenced by the feminist movement, and then um, a major conversion of her life in the beginning of her activism for, for social justice and issues of life. So that's why I give the example of Dorothy Day, of course. I will let you read that. 
um, you haven't um, at some point. I'm going to move to page 389, which begins uh, the um, lesson tonight. Of course, the topic tonight is respect for human life. And there's lots to cover today. So um, we are going to give you general principles that the church teaches for the respect for life. But these issues, uh, you know, are very controversial in our society. And the general principles that the Catholic Church has for the respect of life can then be used for individual circumstances with the advice of priests, most especially priests and people who are moral theologians. So they know the moral principles and that they're able then to uh, apply them in individual circumstances. So tonight it's our attempt to give you the general overall teachings of the church when it comes to the respect for life. And so, obviously they bring up many issues that we're going to review. Murder, abortion, in vitro fertilization, stem cell uh, research and cloning, euthanasia, physician assisted suicide, the death penalty, war, terrorism, scandal, and the right to die. So there's a lot, a lot to cover tonight, okay? <laughs> the first one is, um, we're going to quote from um, Dona Vitae, The Gift of Life. And um, of course that reads, human life is sacred because from its beginning, it involves the creative action of God and it remains forever in a special relationship with the creator who is its sole end. God alone is the Lord of life from its beginning until its end. No one can, under any circumstance, claim for himself the right directly to destroy an innocent human being. Okay? So there, and I want you to make that connection, and I, I underlined human life, the first two <laughs> words, and then underneath that involves the creative action of God, and below that there is a special relationship with the Creator. Okay? And so, the reason why human life is so important and the respect for life is because of that special relationship that humans have with God, their Creator. So special, in fact, that the Church is going to say that all human life should be respected because it comes forth from God, who is the Creator. Uh, paragraph down from there. The fifth commandment calls us to foster the physical, the spiritual, the emotional, and social well-being of self and others. For that reason, it forbids murder, abortion, euthanasia, and any life-threatening acts. We are called to create a culture of life and work against the culture of death. So these are terms that um, Blessed John Paul II um, coined the culture of life versus the culture of death. And that is the real dichotomy that our world is now struggling with. And the complexities of life versus death and the culture that is um, around these issues. So the first thing they say is this whole issue of the culture of life versus the culture of death presents three unique challenges. Okay, three unique challenges. And the first one, we need to counter the relativism that imperils human life by recognizing that human freedom needs to be consistent with God's intentions and God's laws that govern moral life. So the church recognizes right away that there is a relativism in our society. 
that reduces everything basically to not important, to relativize everything. And the church says, no, there are certain moral laws that are given to us by God. They are objective, meaning that they have a certain standard that must always be met. And so we have to counter this relativism that is happening in our society. The second one, this is beautiful, we must witness God's providential presence. God's presence in all creation, most particularly in each human being. So in order to have a respect for life, a culture of life, we must understand that God is in charge of the world and of human beings. And that God has given us certain standards and rules that must be followed in order for the culture of life to blossom forth. And the third one is very important. In fact, um, the whole paragraph is so important. We have to confront the weakening of conscience in our society. It says, in our moments, too many people fail to distinguish between good and evil when dealing with the value of human life. Moral confusion leads many to support choices and policies in our world that desecrate life. Choices that were once considered criminal and immoral have become socially acceptable. Many conscience that were once formed by the Ten Commandments of which we are studying, <coughs> Christ's moral teachings, and the Holy Spirit's grace-filled guidance are now swayed in our society by moral confu confusion of the spirit of the times. We need to deal with the weakening of conscience by helping people to understand the teachings of the church on conscience as a capacity to make judgments, to make decisions, according to God's law, to protect human dignity and reject anything that degrades it. The church is very clear that you must always follow your moral conscience, but you have to follow your moral conscience, but make sure that that moral conscience is well formed, okay? Because some people may make moral decisions that are in fact intrinsically evil um, um, or immoral, and they think because they have the freedom to make that decision that it's okay. Okay, it's not okay to utilize freedom to make wrong decisions. <laughs> and to make wrong decisions that not only have an impact on your personal life, but also the impact of people around you. So yes, God has given us free will to choose. And we need to use our conscience in order to choose, but we must always choose what is truly good for the promotion of life. <coughs> and so we want to make sure that the, con the conscience in each one of us, that which tells us what is right and what is wrong, must be formed according to the laws that God has given us for the respect of life. So the conscience needs to be formed well. If the conscience is not formed well, then we make wrong decisions. Yes, our freedom allows that, but it still doesn't make it right because you have the freedom to make a wrong decision. Okay? There's nothing free about evil and making evil decisions. Everything is binding and oppressive in our human condition when we make evil <coughs> or wrong decisions. Freedom only exists in the good, okay? 
the principle of a good conscience. Okay, so these are the three principles that um, the church is putting before us for the culture of life to counter the relativism that is happening in our society, to witness that God is in charge of the world. We are not, and we must follow his law. And we have to confront the weakening of conscience in our society. Any questions, comments, clarifications, issues, problems? OK, let us then um, go on to say these are life issues that confront us in our modern society. The first one, quote, of course, from the Catholic Catechism, the deliberate murder of an innocent person is gravely contrary to the dignity of the human person, to the golden rule, and to the holiness of our Creator. The Church is very clear, and God is very clear as well. God forbids murder. The innocent and the just you shall not put to death. The intentional murder of any person is strictly forbidden by this commandment. Such actions are gravely sinful. So that is the principle in which we live as Christians and Catholics. That Murder is intrinsically evil in a grave sin. And it goes on to say self-defense against an unjust aggressor, though, is morally permitted. One has a moral duty for the defense of others by those who are responsible for their lives. We have to take care of one another and to um, defend one another. Self-defense or the defense of <coughs> others has the goal of protecting the person or persons who are being threatened, obviously. But once the threat is eliminated, no further action is required. The church is very clear that you cannot you cannot do reprisal for people. You eliminate the threat, and then we move on. <coughs> it says the deliberate killing of the aggressor can be permitted only when no other solution is possible. Thus, the principle in which uh, the police force live by. They respect life, but there is a point when if a person is threatening another, a real threat has a moral ability to defend the person who is being threatened. Any response to, ag of, to aggression must be proportionate to the nature of the threat in the act of aggression, which means that you can't, you should not do anything that is disproportionate to a threat of yourself or another. So if somebody threatens you and punches you in the face, you can't go blow up their house, okay? And you certainly, uh, you know, the church teaches us to forgive um, as much as possible. Murder, that's pretty clear. Um, we'll move on to abortion, which of course is very controversial in our country. Statistics say that uh, a little more than half do not support abortion in our country, but a lot of people do support um, abortion. Legalized abortion is having a destructive effect on our society. A terrible, terrible destructive effect on our society. Um, a beautiful example of somebody who spoke so clearly against abortion was Mother Teresa of Calcutta. Now, Blessed Teresa of Calcutta. I remember uh, a story of when she was visiting 
the United States, uh, the, United, the, uh, the United Nations, of course, in New York. And she was very clear when she says, um, she says, any nation that murders its own will not survive. Will not survive. And, and the moral decay of our country, I believe, is very much connected with uh, the murder of innocent children, a terrible, terrible plague of our society. The church, since its very beginning, has always condemned abortion. We have never strayed from this teaching, nor will we ever stray. No matter how long abortion remains in this country, Catholics will be committed to stopping abortions and ending them in our country. Um, a quote there from the Catholic Catechism. From its conception, the child has the right to life. Direct abortion, that is, abortion willed as an ends, as an end or as a means, is a criminal practice. It is gravely contrary to the moral law. The church imposes the canonical penalty of excommunication for this crime against human life. This is how clear the Catholic Church is. If you know that you will break your relationship with God and with the church, and you directly procure or help somebody procure an abortion, you are automatically excommunicated or divided from or removed from the relationship that you have with Jesus Christ and even with his church as well. Of course, many people don't know that. Many people who procure or help procure abortions don't understand the gravity of excommunication. You have to know the gravity of excommunication in order to create it in you. So when people come to us in the confession and they confess um, either having an abortion or helping somebody have an abortion, one of the first things we need to ask them is did they know that they would be excommunicated from the church. Most don't know that. And, and so if you, you need to have knowledge in order to create the situation of excommunication. But the church places this penalty of excommunication very clearly because of the church's teachings on the importance of life. In the middle of the next paragraph, human life begins at conception, the moment that the egg is fertilized. Okay, we do not end, go into a debate as to when life starts. We are very clear. Life begins at conception, the moment that the egg is fertilized. Many common forms of artificial birth control cause abortions because they do not allow the newly conceived human child to implant in the womb of its mother. And for that reason, they cause abortions as well. And so the church, of course, is very clear about this. The pro-life commitment of the church, our commitment to pro-life is reflected in our compassion. Our compassion so, uh, for those who participate in abortion. When one of the biggest um, intentions that we have when we go to the abortion mill, which we do here every month, uh, we have the fourth, third, or fourth, third, fourth, fourth. I know I go because the Knights of Columbus collect me after mass. Um, <laughs> when we go to the abortion mill, one of the biggest intentions we have is Lord, we're praying for healing for these women who are going into that dreaded building. We pray for the women. We pray for the beautiful children who are being destroyed. It's 
pretty emotional for me to talk about this. Um, we pray for the fathers, many of which have abandoned their, their girlfriends and their wives. And we pray most especially for the conversion of those who participate in this terrible, terrible sin in our society. Um, so we have love and compassion for those who are involved in this. So there is no anger in us towards people who participate in abortions. There is only love and compassion and a prayer for conversion for these people. We have to love them. And um, trust me, I've been in a lot of abortion lines um, praying the rosary, and I've been beaten down by people who have been smacked in the face, uh, I've been pushed, I've been shoved. And my response is always um, love, return in love. I remember once um, I was at an abortion mill and uh, this man brought his wife in to the abortion mill and he came back out. And I, I was just, I just looked at him with love and I said, you didn't leave her in there, did you? And he just looked at me and just kind of like shoved me away. And I was like, don't leave her. If you love her, go get her and get her out of that house of evil. Um, so we not only minister to those who, um, who are considering abortion, but also those who have had abortions. And to help them through that, there are so many women um, who regret what they did. And they just want the church to love them. And they want Jesus to forgive them. And so we have to have an open and compassionate heart. Um, and always try to help people to choose life. To help them to seek back the sacrament of reconciliation. To, come, to give them the necessary counseling that they need. Most of these women have to go to counseling to ask to get it out, to talk about what they did and why they did it, and not only to, yes, to get God's forgiveness, but also to have a person look at them, a real human being, and say, I forgive you for what you did. Now let's pray for your baby. Let's um, thank God that your baby is in heaven. We work with expectant mothers who are considering abortion by encouraging them to choose life for their children. We provide alternatives to abortion through parental care, assistance in raising children, and adoption placement services. So the church, through um, and many organizations, through women's centers, um, and most of our pro-life women's centers, we try to locate very close to abortion centers so that we don't have to have these women travel somewhere else. We can just say, don't go there, go there, across the street, and they'll help you. And so, and we're doing great work, the church is doing great work, along with many pro-life organizations. Um, you know, um, I'm considered a pro-life fanatic. Um, and one <laughs> Christianer actually described me as that, as she said, she was leaving St. Gertrude's because we were, we, were too, um, we were too involved in pro-life movement and I, the pastor, was a pro-life fanatic. <laughs> to which I said, well, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I said, we wish you well wherever you wish to worship. <laughs> so, um, once again, in uh, the issue of abortion, any questions? Yes, Nate. If you're uh, trying to become a pharmacist, and what do you tell your uh, do you tell one of your coworkers like pass out the pills or what, what do you? What do you a lot of a lot of the pharmaceutical companies will respect Catholics who do not want to dispense um, artificial contraception. Um, if you have to, then you should at least formally some. Um, put a, um, a disclaimer in your employment file that says you do this under duress. It is against your Catholic teachings, okay? But if you need to be employed, you need to be employed, okay? 
Um, but many Catholics will say to their to their pharmaceutical companies um, and pharmacies, I'm a devout Catholic, I don't believe in contraception. May I please have the permission not to dispense it? And a lot of the companies will allow that for, for respect of conscience. Mm -hmm. um, 